Welcome to week five of Reflective Practice. And we have uh, Tanya duff Titler from Golden Grove High School bringing to life some of the issues around duty of care. Thank you very much for the reading you've done on the Department for Education uh, document around duty of care, and especially your contributions on the discussion board. Uh, some pretty sad stories, Tanya, actually, <laughs> about uh, teachers who are breaching duty of care from our students' experience in the past and uh, sort of consequences of that for uh, the students. Um, so you can already see what a cutting and important issue it is. And uh, so we're really uh, privileged to have uh, Tanya with us today to bring this to life. As you know, she's the Deputy Principal of Golden Grove, which, uh, and Tanya can correct me if I'm wrong, but she's the only deputy. So, and it's a big school, it's over a thousand uh, students enrolled there. 1,350. Uh, yeah. So big school and you are the only deputy aren't you yeah 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 so uh that means you know she's uh, the deputy the wielding with a star on her chest and the, the guns you know walking the, the corridors <laughs> and um sort of the marshal in charge of law and order sort of but the, we really value uh, your perspective on duty of care and for the students uh, sake um i've asked tanya to do this because um she's been extremely interested in uh, engaging with the University of Adelaide in terms of uh, teaching and learning initiatives. So we've got a really rich and uh, good collaboration there, working with uh, teachers uh, in classrooms and with students. And Tanya's really uh, instigated that and uh, fostered that. So it's because of that high level of uh, concern about our first four weeks of concern for reflective practice around the learning. So that made a beautiful segue now into these next four weeks where we're going to have that more sort of the risk and the danger side and where our duty of care is particularly important for the sake of safety and well-being. So Tanya, we're really glad to have you here. So I will pass straight over to you. Okay, thank you very much. And yeah, I'm very, uh, I feel privileged to be here. So, Judy, so may I just say that um, people can use the text chat to put questions in as as they come up. Tanya's got okay. about 12 people's um, questions from discussion board. So she's mm -hmm. primed to address those. But we okay. will still have a live Q&A because uh, yeah. you won't go for 50 minutes, will you, Tanya? No, no, uh, I won't. And, yeah. you know, quite happy to revert back to the person to person yes. um, Q&A. So, um, John, will you share these slides with everyone afterwards they're in my uni already so they're in the learning management system already yes oh okay these are updated correct and i put them yeah. in uh, about seven minutes ago oh okay sweet sweet awesome okay so what i'll do is i'll um talk around the slide i'm obviously not going to um read it but the overarching principles of duty of care is about teachers, leaders, SSOs, ensuring that we uphold the basic principles of the duty of care. And when I say the basic principles is that we need to mitigate any risks and we need to make judgments of what we deem as potential risks or foreseeable risks. And a really clear example of a foreseeable risk is inclement weather. So we have had to postpone two camps due to inclement weather because the forecast was heavy rain and lightning. So there's a foreseeable risk there. So when we are trying to ascertain what and drill down to what duty of care is, it really is a crucible of potential scenarios and also historical evidence of what the duty of care is. And because of the historical evidence and that um, collective acumen about how people have experienced different experiences on and off site, that's pretty much how we ascertain the duty of care. And so when we think of duty of care, it is in the educational setting, 
but as mandated reporters and as part of the protective practices guidelines and particularly our public sector values, then we also have to provide a duty of care off-site, so out of the educational setting. So I've just put in some uh, acts and regulations that we must abide by. And it's pretty clear we have a duty of care policy and we have the protective practices guidelines which underpins how we should act. Um, now, as the deputy, I guess I always have the, um, in the back of my mind, it's totally running that script of the duty of care. An example is this morning, we've got a new teacher here and I heard her ask an SSO for a um, students to travel in a teacher's car form. So I've called her in and said, now you do realise that under no circumstance are you to have a one-on-one -on -one with a child in your car. Um, you always must have at least two children in your car with you. So that's a duty of care because what could transpire or perhaps what doesn't transpire if there is no other person to um, verify a true and accurate account of events then you're going to get into trouble. And it's also a negation of duty of care. You shouldn't be one-on-one -on -one with a student at any point in time. So, and this is where every case is so um, individualized and it can be very, very complex. So it's really about your obligations at any point in time. And can you, if a um, complaint went higher, if it went to ministerials, um, if it went into the judiciary system to a court hearing, were you acting in a reasonable manner? As long as you were acting in a reasonable manner, and if you had ascertained any foreseeable risk, then you are providing your duty of care. Um, one of the things that I will always ask is, you know, were there any actions or restrictions you could have taken to avoid an accident or injury? I mean, most accidents and injuries are what they are. They are foreseeable and they are an unfortunate accident. So this is just something I want you to um, have a think about and we could possibly you know, come back to it and have a chat about it. But, you know, large school with 1,250 students, there's a shopping centre and some fast food establishments across the road, and the students are renowned for sneaking off during break times or even bludging lessons um, to go and buy food. Now, you may know this is occurring from anecdotal, so people have told you it's occurring. You could be a yard duty teacher, you've witnessed it, but you know you can see them going, but you also have a duty of care to provide that supervision in your allocated um, yard duty environment. As a sub-school leader or a year level leader, it may have been fed back to you from yard duty um, teachers or SSOs that kids are exiting the um, school grounds. Or you could be going off for lunch yourself to grab some lunch and you could see the students there. So um, that scenario has quite a few implications or does it regarding the duty of care? That's the question I want you to think about. So then as a leader, I received this email from another leader questioning about the year 10s exiting the grounds at lunchtime and how this year 10 sub-school leader can continue to provide a duty of care. How are we to manage large groups of students leaving at all different times with multiple exit points from the school? because another conundrum is if we lock the gates 
and decrease our exit points and a high risk scenario occurs, how do we get our kids to exit safely from all exit points if they're closed? So every scenario usually has competing factors and competing scenarios that could um, change the circumstances or the outcome. So we'll get back and we'll have a little bit of a discussion about that. So the foreseeable risks, that's really our, our measure of duty of care. So what are the foreseeable risks? Um, and obviously apart from some certain things, and I'll go into a camps and excursions um, policy the department has, um, as long as we mitigate what we believe could potentially occur, there cannot be any blanket rule because of all the competing factors that come into real life scenarios on and off a school site. So what are some considerations? Obviously school behaviour policy, um, when you're in a classroom, what are your common agreements? So one of the first things you learn are student behaviour management principles, how you manage um, difficult behaviours, uh, do you have a seating um, plan, what are your common agreements and your norms, are there any wh &S risks, obviously when you move into practical based subjects like PE, you know, if you're doing javelin or if you're doing um, oh, what's that one where you shoot the Hmm? Oh, archery. Archery, that's it. <laughs> you, or hit the, you hit the target there. Yeah, oh, thank you. Very funny. So if you are, um, you know, in home ec, then you've got sharp knives, you've got gas. If you're in science, you've got chemicals, so you have to put protective equipment on. So they're basic minimum non-negotiables of your WHNS. Um, the other thing to consider is your level of expertise and what um, is your role and responsibility. So SSOs have different um, roles and responsibilities and duty of care applications than a teacher, than a band one leader, up to me, the deputy of band six, and obviously the principal has the um, overall responsibility. So depending on um, your entry level is going to give you the skills, knowledge and capacity to deal with different uh, situations in real time. And we'll have a, um, a deeper look at this, um, unpacking one of the questions that was posed. Okay, so the Protective um, Practices Guidelines, it's a excellent tool, it's a tri-sector tool, so it has been developed um, in collaboration with the Catholic Education and the Independent Schools, and it's a very um, good in-depth document that, you know, the overarching philosophy is the duty of care, but it gives you quite clear guidelines on how you should uphold that duty of care, the well-being of children. Um, there's lots of information about scenarios, mobile phones, cyber, um, a plethora of things and how, you know, so you would take that advice. It is a, you know, it is a very, very good document to read in its totality to give you an overarching understanding, if not deep understanding of the parameters and the different contexts of um, what is the duty of care and what are educators responsibilities. So um, if we have a look at um, question one that was posed, um, and it's about excursions and how we ascertain if a excursion benefits the learning and overriding some point of risk. Now, every, we, the department, so DFE, we have a camps and excursion policy that we must abide by. It is 
a little bit open to interpretation, but that's when you use the policy with the protective um, practices guidelines as a, um, as a tool for making decisions. But it's also about basically using your brain and mitigating risks. Um, every excursion that occurs, um, you must fill out a departmental form, non-negotiable. Um, if you don't, you are at a absolute open risk for severe mitigation. Um, and as part of that form, the counselling excursions form, you must identify and mitigate any possible risk. If a camp is deemed unsafe, even if it's planned, even if there's a lot of money invested in it, it will not go ahead. It will be cancelled, non-negotiable, and um, it does get called and things do get cancelled. Um, one of the issues that um, can be open to a lot of discussion and a lot of heated discussion is inclement weather, so extremely hot weather or stormy weather. So. A lot of sports days will get cancelled if the um, weather um, is over 37 degrees Celsius, um, but you have to make sure that you communicate this to your stakeholders, which platform you're going to use to ascertain that cutoff. So we say 37 degrees, but uh, a couple of years ago, I've said that we need to communicate to our stakeholders that we're going to use the Bureau of Meteorology as a um, distinguishable factor of the degrees because mobile phone apps can have some variance in them. So any mitigations based on foreseeable risks. And then of course, when we get into the SACE, for example, outdoor education, where they must attend a camp, to perform and undertake um, learning tasks to be assessed on. If your camp gets postponed continuously, then the teachers must um, obviously put in some flexibilities to ensure that the students can learn and progress their learning and be assessed. And Tanya, could I point out that, um, yeah, these are the questions from um, the audience here, from the, yep. the students, just so that they, they might not picked up on that yet. So oh, okay. The students' questions. And of course, that first one is uh, very important because um, everyone is working on assignment three as a group task, which is about designing an excursion, just a one day within Adelaide excursion, but looking through all the documents for the Department for Education and all the weighing up those risk factors. That's yeah. a, it's um, very important application of all the Things, uh, things we're considering for learning and risk when you get onto assignment three. And thanks very much for, for dealing with that, um, Tanya. I'll let no, you get back to question two. Okay, so question two. Given a situation which students are in a dangerous position, um, what can you do as a teacher to resolve this type of conflict? Now, a dangerous position situation, I can, you know, reel off a few, you know, a kid throwing a chair across the classroom my classroom to be exact, um, a kid playing with gas in a commercial kitchen, once again, my commercial kitchen, um, a kid playing with a gas stove with a lighter. So there are so many anecdotal stories that could occur, but one of the most contentious issues which I've chose to address here, and I'm happy when we go into Q&A afterwards to come back to question two or you know have some probing questions thrown at me, I've chosen a fight between um, two, essay, uh, two um, students. Now, it is a quite clear directive to teachers and SSOs when students engage in a physical conflict that we are not to get involved. Okay, so some best practice is to stand strong and firm and use your best teacher voice, which means you scream at the top of your lungs at the kids who are fighting and the kids surrounding you. There's so much going on when a fight breaks out, especially in a large school. You know, you would send, and, and if you've never been in this situation before, you fight or flight or panic mode, like you do not know what to do. 
um, always send a student for help, you know, get other teachers, get backup. There's plenty of people on yard duty or in the class next to you, fights can break out anywhere. Um, the reason we say do not get physically involved if um, a student can come back and say, well, that teacher hit me or that teacher grabbed me. And this has happened quite frequently. Um, and I'm dealing with the, um, the fallout of a situation where a teacher has gone to break up a fight. And usually the student is trying to mitigate their punishment and their consequence by pulling the poor me card out. Um, I stand firm on that. But there is the possibility that something could happen to the child. Now, here's where the contentious issue is. Most long serving teachers that I know would automatically, without having that time to deliberate or think, jump in to try and stop two kids beating the proverbial out of each other. So it really is a contentious issue and I would deal with the, um, the fallout from that as an individual scenario by scenario, case by case. But the directive is you seek help. But in reality, most long service teachers will jump in and break it out, break it up. Okay, question three. Um, this was, uh, you know, this is interesting. So we're talking about filtering systems on the internet with the possibility of um, diminishing the right for free access of information. Now, this is, is quite clear. Uh, at our school, we have a ICT um, user agreement and we also have a mobile phone policy. Most schools have very, very strong filtering systems in place for two reasons. One, to protect um, our young people from content that they should not be accessing or viewing. Um, protect them from predators but also to protect our systems, right, which is usually left off of um, people's um, conceptual thoughts. We need to actually protect our systems from cyber attacks and from phishing emails. So we need these very, very strong filters. Now, there is so much content available that the balance of the human rights equation, if a student wishes to access certain content, then they can do that in the privacy of their own homes. We need to have these strong systems in place to project, to protect the majority and to also protect our infrastructure and our systems. So it's not really um, de defying human rights to access information because they still can do that, just not in the school context because our duty of care to protect them in the virtual domain surpasses their need to access a specific website. Okay, so this was... <coughs> Interesting, I can tell you that if this scenario where a child was pulled out by their earlobe or even touched by a teacher, there would be probably a ministerial complaint, so a complaint made to the department and then that would escalate to the minister and we would be dealing with this quite severely. Under no circumstance should a teacher touch a student without that student's permission. Now, oh, spelling mistake, it's not, not meant. The teacher would be held to account even in the private and Catholic sectors, absolutely. Does it happen? Do teachers, you know, forget that quite 
clear distinctive barrier? Yes, we do. We are human. The amount of times, you know, I've clicked a, a kid on the shoulder and told them to be quiet or, you know, have gone to take their earphones off of them because I've asked them five times to hand their earphones off. Um, but generally, when something like this, this incident, the, the question that I got given and the example is an absolute definite, it should never have occurred. There are certain situations where the boundaries may be blurred. And in this instance, you would have a leader do multiple investigations. So when a parent, an angry parent contacts me about some form of physical contact that they believe shouldn't have occurred, then it's I have to um, work with my leaders and undertake our due diligence to do a very, very thorough investigation, which could take anywhere between three and five days, depending on, you know, and I tell, I communicate this back to parents and caregivers that we need to undertake our due diligence, and it could take between three and five days, because the more questions you ask about a situation, the more information that you get given. And then you have to be discerning, you have to pick the students um, who witnessed it. And if you had five students, 10 students, there could be um, a difference in what they believe they witnessed and what actually happened. Um, but this particular question posed, it is extremely straightforward and that person would be held to account and possibly um, mitigated against them in a court of law. Okay, so I um, joined two questions together here. So which methods have been proven to be most effective to mitigate risk of harm? And how can educators balance maintaining a duty of care while providing various opportunities for student participation? So like I have talked about before, we have our policies and then we have our guidelines. So if we're looking at a WHNS policy, if we're looking at a camps and excursions policy, then we would overlay that with the protective practices guidelines. If we're looking at a duty of care and mandatory reporting, um, then that's another process. So, Seeking um, and finding the information um, and a really interesting um, one that came up a couple of years ago is for me where I heavily used the guidelines, but the department also has a legal um, section that we can ask for advice. So I pulled the guidelines to pieces and this was about a teacher who felt intimidated by a group of students on yard duty, didn't know who the students were and it was ongoing during her yard duties. So she took a picture of the students. Now, you would think that if a student was, be, uh, a teacher was feeling intimidated that they had the right to do that. But it was a point of contention because in the um, protective practices guidelines, it says you are not to photograph students um, but then you read other things that say you're not to photograph and hold photographic evidence of students. But then if you look at the cyber laws, you shouldn't share any photographs of minors. So depending on the level of foreseeable mitigation and how far a parent or caregiver wants to push an issue, um, it's really important that leadership access as many guidelines and policies but also I've put in there seeking advice from experts so experts in the field experts in teaching and learning areas if it is an excursion going to um, other um, department areas such as you know the legal department and I know that the Catholic and independent schools also have um, legal departments um, allocated to them. And then there are also within our uh, Department for Education, 
there is the, um, you know, partnership and schools and preschool division. So they are ultimately responsible for writing the duty of care policy. So if you had um, any issues or needed to uh, dig deeper or provide some um, extracts from documents to support your case when talking with um, families about their students and about a situation, and you could also seek advice from there. Okay, being a new teacher, do you have any advice pointers, things to look for that may help duty of care in the classroom or in the yard? <laughs> um, if whoever put this in or if someone else wants to drill down on this, all I can say is, um, you know, go with your gut. Your gut's generally right. If you can feel something's not quite right, it generally isn't. Um, th this is stuff in the classroom and in the yard. Secondly, if you see a crowd, you know something's going down. If you see students walking hastily, you know something's going down. But generally, it's that energy exchange. You know that something's going on. So, you know, make sure your sixth sense is activated or, you know, you're, you are paying attention to your gut instincts because usually when I'm having conversations with teachers, they start with, oh, I knew something was going to happen. They always say that. It's that, you know, that natural instinct. Um, you know, building relationships with students really, really important, but being absolutely firm, even if you're, um, am I allowed to say shitting yourself? Like, even if you're in a situation where, you know, you're very nervous, uh, even fearful, you've got to practice, even if it means, if you know that you're a very um, quiet and subdued individual, you need to stand in front of that mirror and practice your strong, powerful teacher voice. Power of the voice is very powerful. Now, this was an interesting one. What made you make the change from classroom teaching to your current role as deputy principal? Well, let's, and may I sneak a second question. How has your perception changed of the role of teachers and challenges school faces your current role as opposed when you're a classroom teacher? Okay, so I still teach. Um, I teach one class and that's what brings me absolute joy in the role. I've got lots of other stuff, but that is one of the things that brings me absolute joy. I am also a home group teacher. So I lead student voice at this school, which is student um, leadership. I'm a home ecce by trade. I used to be a chef. Um, so I've only been in um, the school system for 13 years. So what made me made the jump, just being tapped on the shoulder to take leadership roles, even this one, I was tapped on the shoulder by another principal and told to apply and I won it and I, I love it. Um, how has my perceptions changed of the roles of teachers? Well, it hasn't. Um, I will always, when I start processing a thought or a movement forward, I always go through consultation but in the back of my mind, I always think, and I'm very, very mindful of, if I'm a full-time teacher teaching five classes with three yard duties and a home group, how would I react to that change? How would I react to those decisions? So um, when I first started in, in, the, in education in the department, um, I heard a lot about um, oh, leaders, you know, always forget about the teacher. Leaders don't consider teachers, leaders this. Le and I knew that I was never gonna be one of those leaders. I would never forget the fully loaded teacher in their classroom with potentially 120 students that they're teaching and assessing and supporting and taking care of. Okay, so with the department, um, 
these are some outside agencies um, and external agencies that we use to um, support us in the duty of care and wellbeing, but also um, dealing with behaviour issues with students and trying to build their capacity to um, not escalate or de-escalate or use exit cards so they don't escalate and then um, cause a hazard either for themselves or others. Um, so we use attendance officer, home visits. So obviously um, I did a home visit to check on a student a couple of weeks ago and took a colleague with me because you would never go um, by yourself. Um, we, I access the department's legal um, department. Um, there is an engagement and wellbeing directorate. And then obviously our online tools. So um, we have what we call ED155s, which is a injury report form. Doesn't matter if it's a teacher, SSO or student, same report form. Uh, ECAL, so the online child abuse uh, notification platform. And we also at the school have a department um, incident and response management system. So if any big incident happens, um, you know, knock on wood, you know, if there's a, a death um, at the school or if the police come or if there's a fire or a hazard, um, big incidents must be recorded. And all of that, you know, comes under the banner of duty of care. Um, duty of care is also not just the physical environment, it is the sociological and also the emotional and well-being um, and psychological areas as well. So a lot of people just think duty of care physical, but they, yeah, the parameters are much um, wider. So we use the police to do welfare checks. Um, if there is um, any, any fight that occurs on or off site with our students, um, obviously sexualized behavior or pornography, um, if students bring alcohol or drugs to the school and get busted, we contact the police. And so those police reports are really, really important. Okay, ICT, obviously we live in a hyper-connected digital world, um, which is bizarre because, you know, our young people are more disconnected than I've ever seen them. So we have our own um, agreement. But also if we see um, issues or images on the socials like Instagram or Facebook, where to report them to, there's actually a cyber reporting agency that um, we can report any cyber crime. So it can be a cyber crime, it can be a hack, it can be um, dissemination of um, you know, pornographic materials, bullying and harassment. And so we use both platforms. We use the um, government um, platform and um, also the police. So both um, will generate a, um, a, a reference number. And so we keep those as part of our files. And then obviously we use our internal departmental um, record keeping, which would be an ED155 or the ERMS, the incident management system. And then another point is the recording we would do on our learner management system in our student records. Which brings me to the hot tips. So, hot tip number one, document. Follow process. Processes are there to protect all people. There we go again, document. Seek advice. The more advice you seek, the more you're undertaking your due diligence and it's gonna help you make a very strong informed decision. Document, surprise, surprise. Stay neutral, don't get involved in family matters. I always say, do not write anything. Do not put anything in writing that you wouldn't send to your grandparent or that you wouldn't be hiding 
your head in the sand if it turned up in a court of law because anything you write or say can and will be used against you. And that is it. Thanks so much, Tanya. That's fantastic. So now we've got uh, time. I'd invite everyone to turn on their cameras and let's see how everyone's microphone on. And there hasn't been any um, chat comments yet, but I'll monitor that. But um, over to you to uh, throw out some questions to Tanya. You might even make some comments, uh, some observations. Um, but uh, there's a great, uh, we've got about nine minutes where we can uh, milk Tanya for all she's worth with her uh, thinking of duty of care. So questions and comments. Um, I had a question, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> in my car, um, <laughs> not driving. Um, but cool. I had a question about um, with kids, I had it on the discussion board, but um, with kids that maybe the school knows that they're probably using drugs outside of school and things like that, but they're not bringing them into school yet, right? And they are aware that maybe just a little bit of drug use, not overly, not enough to maybe get the police involved or anything. But um, do teachers have like kind of a duty of care to maybe approach the student and maybe point them in the right direction? Maybe say, hey, there's some counsellors. Hi, there's some places that you can go. Maybe just give them some information without scaring them in a way because I know that a lot of students like the teachers will be aware that they're using drugs or a small amount or something like that or getting into the wrong crowds and they don't stop it until it's too late do you know what I mean so yeah yep yep I know exactly what you mean so it really depends on the culture of the school we have a zero tolerance here um, and the way we structure our school is that we have Obviously, our home group teachers, which ideally they get them in year eight, and it's the same home group teacher that follows them through to year 12. Um, we also have a wellbeing team, which has a wellbeing leader, um, a counsellor, we have a hub, and we have um, psychologists who also come in. We have a sub school. So um, every sub school has an executive leader. So I'm the executive leader of year 10 and I stay at year 10, but the leaders generally go up with their students. And so I have a coordinator and a manager. Now, what I can tell you is what happens at this school, at my last school, Henley, is that a teacher will notice something. Now the advice, um, paradigm is really interesting because what I will tell my teachers is only give advice to the level that you are either qualified, extremely knowledgeable about, knowledgeable about or are comfortable with, you know, let the people who have the tools to deal with it, deal with it. So our teachers here would notice it and then they would report it generally to the sub-school leader. And we don't shy away from difficult conversations. We actually um, come down quite um, firm, but very supportive of our students. So um, our particular students and our cohort, we know that some of these um, unsafe behaviours and practices are actually generational. So you have to take that into account. Um, but we don't pretend it doesn't happen. We definitely don't shy away from it. We deal with it. We put in support strategies. We ask them to go see the counsellor. We push them to go see the counsellor. We push more. We have honest conversations with the parents, sometimes with the students not in the room. Um, so we approach it with a real well-being um, perspective because we want to you know like you said before it's too late we want to be the ones to try and put in as much support um, on site and using outside agencies because some students don't want to talk with um, people on site especially the tough guy ones because um, they don't want to be seen to be going to the hub so we definitely approach it with the well-being um, we do locker searches. If someone says so-and-so has, you know, I will bring another, um, and usually I do the locker search with another um, staff member with me 
we would have no um, issues in calling in the police. If we suspect, we as part of departmental policy, we need to have principal approval before we bring the police in to do a search or talk to kids. But no, nah, we we don't show away from it. We deal with the issues that we have. Yeah, that's really we have good. We a duty of care to, to support these kids, be it to try and kick them out of jail, all right, yeah. and really tell them, no, this is not good, or the well-being stuff and try and get them out of that generational cycle. Mm. I was going to say, yeah, because I know that some private schools kind of like, put their heads down <laughs> and pretend like it's not happening. And then when the kid brings something to school, they just ask them to leave. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's really, I think, yeah, it's really good to hear that like a school actually does want the best for the kids. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and what you have said, obviously I would never talk about any other school other than the schools I've been in. But what you have said, Monica, is something I have heard time and time again yeah it is very very sad and it does happen and i hope that it does change soon <laughs> thanks for the question monica that's great uh, what about another question uh, from the, the floor uh, or a comment tanya i've got a question um and i don't know if this is an extension of duty of care but i'm interested in age being mental health at golden grove um, um, and you cut out on me just you then. Can you just repeat it? After you. Josh, you, you're sure. cutting so out a bit. I'm, Could you repeat once more? Yeah, sure. I'll say it again. Um, I wonder how, I'm asking how Golden Grove handle um, teacher well-being as well as mental health um, at Golden Grove and if that's an extension of duty of care, looking after the teachers as well as the, the students. Yeah, okay, that's a really good um, question. Uh, duty of care generally has the connotations um, attached to the duty of care that we provide our students, but we absolutely have a duty of care um, to our teachers. And the department actually sends out a perception survey um, every year. Um, it's, it's a new thing, so this is the third year and it collects that data for us to see how staff are faring emotionally, psychologically, and also how they perceive leaders. So me in particular, and our ethos here is I um, will always go into bat to my teachers, but I tell them, you make sure you follow process. You make sure that you document everything. When it comes to a time when they feel that they can't handle a parent. Any teacher here knows they come to my office and they normally come with their laptops in tow. And I know that parent, I just, yep, don't talk to them anymore. So I back my teacher's wellbeing 100%. I also am an advocate for them filling out ED155s, which is that hazard form that you fill out for an injury. So even if, you know, when they're being abused by a student or they're feeling vulnerable or they're feeling um, intimidated, those emotional uh, damages, they need to be recorded. We need to be aware of them and I need to jump in and support my staff. So staff, there has been a culture where staff feel that, oh, if they fill one of them out, that leadership might think they're weak or pathetic or not a good teacher. No, I want the best teachers here that I can have. And everyone knows that to have a good teacher, you need a well-being. And to have a well-being, we must consider all those things. And I'm a little bit of an advocate for, I don't want to say take a sickie, but I will absolutely tell my staff take a few well-being days. You need to rest your mind. You need to settle. You need to calm. Take well-being days and then return. Right. Thanks, Tanya. And Thank I think on, on that note, um, we'll have to um, stop there. But I, I'd invite everyone to um, maybe uh, shout out to Tanya uh, goodbye and a thanks. And uh, I know we have to rush to 
some people have very important class next tenure about half, <laughs> half the group here. So um, we'll see it. Uh, some of you down say, the basement. Yeah, go sorry, on. Sorry, John. If there yeah. are any pending questions, give them to John and he'll send them through and I'll answer them. Yeah. There's more on the discussion board, but I've just got the top, the first town, 12, I think. Yeah. Okay. So thanks, Tanya. And no uh, shout thanks, out everyone. Lady Althouse. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See Thank half you. of you in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> God. <laughs>